So I'm gonna warn you, put a helmet on for this one. The viewing is going to be a rough landing. It seems like it's like one of those 80s movies that were really trying to capitalize on being in 80s movies, and they needed to have like a horror movie out the door pronto. So you know Papa Roanoke only brings you the, uh, well, one of the movies of our time for sure. The human brain, neurologically speaking, is quite the complex organ. While the brain would have you believe that it is the most important organ because it's your brain, the reality is there are many other systems that assist or outright control the processes of the body without much help from the brain. Granted, if those uh, systems are completely severed from the brain, uh, they will completely stop. But the body for a time does run on itself. This dichotomy between the human brain's functionality and the life support systems that exist underneath us has led to some interesting expressions of say, some diseases over time. Because while the body is just as complex, the brain is still ultimately in control of our functioning. While this isn't exactly groundbreaking information, I know it does highlight when an infection taking place specifically within our brain, it can have interesting consequences for the body as it displays levels of severity associated with the pathogen. In 1988, a college campus would be besieged by an outbreak of a disease that would threaten to go well beyond just the confines of the campus if not properly controlled and put down. It would result in violent students with increased strength and zero regard for human life. However, what was more alarming is it would appear that the brain was still slightly functional, giving them the ability to think through plans and if they recognize the victim, they might be even able to control themselves to some degree or react even more aggressively and this would just take place for only about a moment before, you know, ape brain takes over. This specific pathogen would affect critical areas of the brain associated with behavioral control, which would ultimately lead to the host to become hostile towards everyone that they came across, and in some cases, against the other infected that might stand in their way. Well, what exactly is the pathophysiology of this disease in primal rage? Let's discuss that in today's episode. And also, it's called Primal Rage. I always get questions from people asking, well, what's the movie name? It's Primal Rage. But first, this episode is sponsored by everyone's favorite mobile game, Rage Shadow Legends. Professor Death Knight here with a lesson about Live Arena, the new PvP mode where you can fight against other players in real time. <gasps> Sounds terrifying? Well, so is going to the dentist. You should still do it. Live Arena has a draft feature where you can pick and ban champions to fight for you. <laughs> Teamwork! When you win matches, you'll get live arena crests towards unlocking special area bonuses, or so I hear. I'm too afraid to try any of this out. Alright class, any questions? So Professor Death Knight, what is your strategy for, you know, a live arena? Well, everyone thinks I'll go in fighting, but nobody expects my charm. My best strength is the gift of gab. So when they try to attack, I'll just be like, nice weather we're having, eh? Nobody will see it coming. Well, Professor Death Knight, how do you feel about banning champions from the live arena? I hate it. I wish everybody could play. Back in school, I would always get picked last. This is just like when someone pointed at me and said, you can't even play and your bones look weird. But you know, rules are rules, so. Now, most importantly, how do you actually talk to women? Okay. All right, thanks for your contribution. I don't totally know what you were asking, but I loved that you had the courage to ask it. I hope you use this knowledge you've gained here today about Live Arena to head off and do battle! Live! Make this whole dead bones professor proud, folks. Class dismissed! We have a bell? Oh, we should totally get a bell. So right now, Raid Call of the Arbiter is in full swing, and to celebrate, there are some new characters from the series in-game as champions, such as Artak, a mighty Wark Orlord, and it's cool because he's available for free, and all you have to do is log into Raid for seven days between now and July 24th. And if you've seen episode one of Call of the Arbiter, you'll definitely want this guy, and if you haven't seen it, what are you waiting for? Go check it out, and then remember to log in for seven days, and you get Artak. And what's that? You haven't started playing Raid but are interested? Using the link in my description or scanning my QR code up on screen right now, you can get some insane bonuses. Bonuses like the epic champion Talia and other useful things. Once you're in game crushing your enemies, you can come find me under the name Roanoke and if you're fast enough, you can even join my clan. Just hit the link in the description and I'll see you on the battlefield. So now that that's over, let's get into it because half the people have already clicked off and let's collectively make fun of them. Friggin' nerds. Nerd. <laughs> Moving on. We begin our story looking at a tree, but not just any tree, a swamp tree. You already know how this is going to go. Swamps never denote anything good. But, I mean, I guess technically it's an Everglades tree as it takes place at a North Miami campus. Also, it's the 80s, so everyone is wearing jeans, jean jackets, and jean shirts, while people do aerobics in the open with a weirdo with the camera just kind of taking pictures of them in Florida in August. Eh, what a time to be alive. Oh, look, a couple getting hot and bothered on a lawn. <laughs> In Florida, in August, like, bro, everything is sticky. 
there must be something in the water. It's amoebas. It's always amoebas in the water. And this guy just continues walking around taking pictures of people. I'm thinking at this point, he needs to be put on a list. And why is everyone excited to see him? Like, I'm sure if you did this nowadays, someone would be throwing a stick in your front wheel spokes. It's me. I would be throwing the stick. But thank God we're finally moving on. As a woman's car gets towed, it's the 80s, and she can't afford to miss her class. I like where this is going. Unfortunately, Moped Man then shows up and takes pictures, and he threatens the guy because the car isn't ticketed, so it can't be towed away. Hmm. If you say so, man. So hey, this is actually uh, Roanoke in the future once more. This was bugging the crap out of me last night when I was thinking about it, so I looked it up. Remember, this takes place on a college campus, which is considered private property. And because it is private property, the school is under no legal obligation to warn an illegally parked car owner before towing. No ticket required. Tow companies are required, though, to alert the police department within 30 minutes after towing it, but that's about it. I knew this was a stupid point to make, uh... But don't worry, most of this movie is a stupid point to make. So we meet up with the other guy, Duffy. He's a bleeding heart, calling the women solicitors, wanting to know what's going on with the baboon that we are about to see, raging through campus, tearing apart professors. You know, pretty much all the hits that aren't going to get you any action in college. Jumping over to said baboon, we see... Wait a minute, does that scientist have a ponytail? Holy lord. I mean, honestly, why didn't I think about wearing one of those bad boys in the lab? They inject the baboon with something that is apparently going to restore the function of the baboon's brain because they intentionally damaged it. So, intentionally destroying neuronal tissue in the rat's brain, this is discussed earlier, cytoplasmic regeneration took only about 20 minutes or so, which for brain function to return at that speed would be absolutely insane, because that would require an insane amount of mitosis, which would create heat, which would then cook the surrounding tissue in the brain. But we'll kind of go over that in a second concerning neuroplasticity. Now, baboon brains are a little more complicated. They expect that it will probably regain about 100% of its brain function, and it's definitely not going to be the inspiration for the movie 28 Days Later. Where would you get that idea? Is it because it's a baboon raging? I don't know. So moving back over to the neuroplasticity for a moment, whoever figures out how to accelerate healing in the human brain will be the first trillionaire of our time. The brain is notoriously slow in its ability to kind of self-repair after an event that has caused it damage, but this does not mean that it cannot, like, attempt to heal itself, along with uh, what has developed at least other ways to remain functional, although most times this can be kind of resulting in a decreased capacity to even function to begin with. The first way in which the brain will adapt to damage incurred, which results in uh, the death of some tissues, will be to reroute the function. Areas of the brain will actually take over other areas that are no longer functional. For instance, strokes associated with Broca's area of the brain, just behind the prefrontal cortex, where this is essentially how you speak, strokes will actually render you the inability to speak. However, should they survive the stroke and enter therapy, there have been stories of the ability of speech to spontaneously return, and this is not because the area of the brain is repaired and neurons are in there, but other areas are still functional and now took on the role of coordinating speech. Through time, speech may get better and better as those connections form, and say like the temporal lobe, for example, and that's just an example. It can actually form in other areas, but the ability to speak will actually return to the person. The other possibility is the actual division of the neural cells within the brain itself to repair the damaged areas. Now, clearly we do not have neurons form like only during the embryonic stage as we grow into an adult. The neurons have to come from somewhere else. It is known that there are two areas of the brain where new neurons can form, but for the most part, mature neurons of the brain cannot undergo mitosis, which believe it or not is actually a good thing. If it did, memories would be destroyed fairly quickly as the web work to make up a memory would be altered. Functionality of the body would also be hindered, and in general, it would be a pretty bad time if we wanted a state of permanence in our world. But I want you to remember specifically this point. While the brain does not repair through division of neurons, I mean, first at some point past the embryonic stage, our neurons must have divided, which they did. Even the frontal lobe doesn't really finish developing in adults until they're around 25 years old, with some arguments made that doesn't actually stop until your 40s. But there are some areas where neurons seem to be created, meaning that areas apart from main brain functions have the ability to repair through the creation of more neurons. So, as the baboon freaks out, it begins reeing. They look at his EEG, and the graph shows ups and downs. Yep, that appears to be data of some sort. Okay, so as they walk out, it's only been like two years that they've been experimenting with this, and this is like some crazy breakthroughs in the data that shows that mice have their brain being repaired. Again, that's a monumental breakthrough. The application comes from attempting to figure out how they can apply this to humans. Mr. Corpo over here, though, wants to know part of it because of that one screaming monkey, and in the middle of their positive directional course set for mankind concerning our species trajectory talk, oh, thank God, Moped Man has arrived to an interview that he never even really scheduled with the doctor, but the doctor appears to be a little preoccupied with his job. 
Also, I want you to know that is an absolutely cherry 1971 Buick Skylark. Uh, the face on these things is about as ugly as an ape, but it's in beautiful shape, and considering you could slam a 350 into that gal making 315 horsepower, well, they can get you where you want to go. I mean, again, it's nothing compared to the 1967 Impala, but most vehicles aren't, but still. Uh, also, just randomly, I'm restoring a 1969 Mustang with a 302 currently on Instagram. It has nothing to do with any of this, but if you want to see its progress, just look up Roanoke Gaming, and back to the brain aids we go. Walking along campus, a woman yeets the door open, knocking down who I'm going to assume is just the main love interest as she heads to her dorm. Also, uh, I thought this was going to be important to the plot somehow, like, oh, she's infected and running away, but in reality, she just sort of, like, knocks down Laura and goes, uh, woo, get out of the way. And wearing her jean jacket, of course. So we now meet Lauren's roommate, Debbie. She was Perganonant, and, um, unfortunate events befell her. Moving to the bar, we meet up with Duffy again, hanging out with Moped Man. They are discussing the baboons as Duffy then puts something in some dude's drink. I'm assuming it's a laxative. At least that's what I hope. The other guy then walks off as they continue talking about breaking into the lab. Mopan Ben gives Duffy his camera because he's got the only one in town. As in Duffy heads for the lab, and for some reason, the cops are like already there. Now, good lord, look at that radio antenna. Also, you can't hear it, but the audio used to respond to the police officer when he opens up his radio is literally just somebody making radio noises dubbed over the movie. It was absolutely hilarious. So Duffy now heads in there, and here's a guy running by. And then we get some real 80s break it into places music, which is wonderful. Heading inside, the computers are compiling, the baboon chairs are empty, and the baboon's brains are regrowing. He takes a picture, and mission accomplished, you think. It's time to go home, but you would be wrong. We need to blind the baboon at least 12 more times. And much like how the outbreak of 28 Days Later started, it's always got to be some dude with earrings and rounded glasses, doesn't it? So obviously the baboon is getting a little upsetty spaghetti as he's like, don't worry, only a few more cod flashbangs to your retinas and you're good to go. Because again, one isn't enough. The baboon at this point escapes by breaking open the cage, literally due to the agitation brought on by the camera, and bites Duffy, breaks through the window as an alarm is set off. The baboon makes a glorious break uh, out into the road as a cop car ends up hitting a mannequin of a baboon. The practical effects of this movie are glorious. The doctor now arrives to find his prized student, the baboon, is gone. The cops are like, oh, he attacked the car. You see, that's not how I recollect that at all. I think you just hit it with your cruiser. So now we move over to uh, math class, which is a little hell for me. There's a reason Roanoke Mathing was never a channel on this godforsaken platform. One of the students is hot for teacher for all the wrong reasons. You know, she needs a passing grade. He's a sleazeball, a match made on the internet. But what I find funny is they are like talking about Debbie as she walks in as if this is high school. Uh, bro, this is college. Nobody cares about your high school clicks. I remember in college, the freshmen coming in, if they knew one another, would like attempt to enforce the social hierarchies of their previous... It was cringe, bro. It was... You just laugh in their face. Anyways, we're all adults now, and it's party time, so that's just how that goes. Heading over to the frat boys, they're just attempting to be alpha chads, but they're coming off as beta males, possibly even omegas. Oof. And saying oof in 2023 is big oof. I, I don't know. What do the kids say nowadays? I'm sure it ain't that. Luckily, cameraman is now once again here somehow, and we finally get a name. This is literally like 20 minutes into the movie. Somehow, she also got a name before the audience gets one. His name is Sam, and he's white knighting hard. Not my words, that's what Debbie said, the nuclear physicist. And no, really, that's what she's here for school as. Anyways, Sam then walks the girl to class as we see him on his moped again. I'm convinced the entire reason he has a moped is because if they gave him an actual car and how much he's required to drive in filler shots, they would have blown the whole budget on gas alone. So Sam now goes to visit Duffy as this dude is beginning to look fairly ill. He's there to get his camera as Duffy says that, oh, I wasn't there, don't even worry about it. I had nothing to do with the breakout of that baboon. Sam is there to get Duffy because apparently they're going on a date with uh, some of those girls that he met. And he says, oh, don't worry, I already set you up, to which I do not remember that interaction whatsoever. So Sam is a little overconfident here, but apparently everybody loves him, so why not? Duffy seems like a hard sale, though, I'm not gonna lie. It's your boy who is standing in the corner eating paste, and you walk up to a girl like, hey, he thinks you're cute, and she's like, yeah, I gotta go. So uh, Duffy goes and puts alcohol in his wound, and then screams like a prepubescent youngling. Like, my man, it doesn't burn that bad. Which I said that about hydrogen peroxide, and everybody told me I was wrong. Do you guys remember hydrogen peroxide actually burning your wound? I just do not remember that. I remember it bubbling and feeling like static. Alcohol kind of burns it, but I mean, come on, it ain't that bad. However, what we do see is the wound pulsating, which gives us a clue as to what's happening. From what we have seen, there is a very specific function by this doctor's design, but first we need to establish what it is. The doctor later will mention how he's actually got an antigen to the actual brain repairing mechanism, which says to me, what we are dealing with here is very much so likely a virus. 
which is essentially perfect for a few things. First, the running meme on this channel, and second, the ability to control and potentially reactivate mechanisms concerning neuron mitosis. Also, if you guys are enjoying stuff like this and me covering like lesser known movies, likes are like the number one way to get the videos picked up by the algorithm. Leaving a like does help me a lot more than you might think, so if you wanna do that, it is greatly appreciated. And subscribing also lets me know that you guys do in fact kinda of dig these lesser known movie videos. So just, yeah, if you wanna do that, perfect. If not, don't worry about it, we're moving on. So first things first, this is very clearly a virus of sorts that we were dealing with as mentioned, but it's a special type of virus that would prefer to infect the central nervous system over other parts of the meat in the body. Because of this, you're gonna love this, because I do, it appears to be a repurposed rabies virus. You don't say! Now don't click off yet. Uh, what the doctor has been able to do with the virus is highly interesting. The natural form of rabies, which is heavily known by frequent watchers of this channel, but for all you new nerds out there, let's get into it real quick. In the wild type variant, it will enter the body through broken skin, typically through a bite wound or scratch, where it will then enter the peripheral nervous system, essentially drawn to the neuronal tissue. Using protein transporter mechanisms, it is then rocketed to the spinal column as it enters the cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. From here, it will head towards the central and most important area of the central nervous system, the brain. Once it has infected the brain, it will cause the meninges to swell, putting pressure on the brain itself, increasing aggression in animals as they are in pain, and biting just really comes natural to them. In humans, there have really been no cases of a person just completely losing control emotionally of themselves and attacking another person. So it should be known that humans have more control and outlets for our actions. As this disease progresses, it will result in things like hydrophobia, for instance, or the inability to drink water, because of the coordination required for the esophagus to properly function, and this will be disrupted by the virus, causing issues with the neurons firing and communicating. Eventually, this does result in the end of whatever animal it infects, except for bats, apparently. And to me, rabies is one of the more horrifying diseases because a lot of people will contract it without ever even knowing they were bitten by bats in the night because they never actually feel it. But the point is, this family of lists of viruses will target this nervous system directly, and that's exactly what the doctor wants, which as we move along in this movie, we'll get more in depth with this viral explanation. So Dr. Feelgood at this point with a ponytail gets a call as his investor is quite angry that the baboon is gone. While he's lost in thought, the doctor gets the tape and then watches and discovers it was Duffy flashbanging the baboon. He immediately calls the police, one of the more sensible things to happen in an 80s movie, to be honest. That night at the bar, it's violently 80s in here. People are slow dancing to 80s music. How many times can I mention 80s in a sentence? But I really think more importantly, how can you slow dance to 80s music? That might be the strangest thing in this movie. Meanwhile, Duffy is sitting there sweating like a prostitute on Judgment Day. As the men leave to go use the bathroom together, all right, the frat boys see their opportunity to head over. As a former frat boy, I disavow these losers. They're big cringe. Also, while they're in the bathroom, Duffy and Sam have like a really close relationship, and Duffy continues to not look so hot. Frat Boy sits down with the girls as Duffy then grabs one of the dude's arms when he comes back, looking a little grumpy and almost breaking his radius and all the bone. I'm looking for gains like that myself. Now, how is this possible? Well, it's clear to me that, as mentioned, since the virus is targeting the actual nervous system of the individual, there may be a few things going on. First, it should be known that the doctor appears to have found an early example of gene editing utilizing viruses as the vector in order to deliver this capability. Rabies being a natural choice due to its propensity to target the nervous system upon injecting the specifically formulated kind of enzyme that he would have created or genetic material, this information would enter the nerve cells specifically and it likely contains a transcription factor. But what is a transcription factor? I'm glad you asked. Essentially, these are the gatekeepers for the operation of genes. Their operation involves the switching on and off of certain genes. Neurons do have the capability in their genes to divide regardless of maturity levels or how long they have been around. That's the point to remember because while those genes are naturally switched off for us now, it is still there. And this is because at one point they were required to divide to create you. That information is still going to be housed within those cells. By utilizing this transcription factor, the neuron's mitotic abilities have been flipped back on, allowing for the cell to divide, which much like with the mice would cause the brain to repair itself over time as damaged or dead neurons would be replaced by living new neurons. Now this sounds all well and good until you look at the results. We see the increased strength is shown in Duffy. This strength would likely signal there is an issue with the amount of neurons dividing. Motor neurons send all the electrical currents to the muscles, causing them to contract. 
it would appear that after the infection, all neurons would continue to divide. Sounds great until you realize there are several issues with too many electrical signals contracting the muscles of the body. When this happens, it would increase strength in Duffy as more muscles being utilized in a single contraction, but this would in turn cause a person to have their muscles break down more quickly, damaging it as well as every action that the muscle must contract with would be contracting it at its full potential, which causes damage. This is very bad for your joints, longevity, as well as just your bones in general and your ability for your muscle to survive. Sam and Lauren then head back to Sam's because it's college and bringing a girl back to your dorm is just par for the course. Ah, memories. Lauren then asks Sam, so like, what are we? after one date, sealing the deal like you would not believe. They share a kiss and Sam's worried about Duffy. Okay then, can't say that'd be me thinking about my friend during a time like that, but hey, again, maybe that's just me. Debbie then acknowledges Duffy's sweating, which made me laugh because when I first met my wife, like the first time we ever hung out, it was, I believe, August in Georgia on campus. And I walked across campus to go meet up with her somewhere and I started sweating really bad because A, I was nervous and B, it was really hot outside. <laughs> and I get there and she asked me if I need a beach towel. Ugh, hmm. Not one of my more alpha Chad moments. Anyways, uh, Debbie's backstory is now depressing as they sit down and talk by a pool. Mom ran bad checks and is in jail. Dad got caught up in a real estate scam and is in jail. Dog ran away and now is in the pound. Nice, bro. Debbie is pretty hot and bothered, though, as a guy stood up for her, so they make out as one does, but then he bites her. All right, man, that might be a little much for the first date, but uh, hey, you do you, because she's like, okay, never mind, ha, that's totally fine. So the next morning, everyone at the university clinic is undoubtedly there for a gonorrhea test to be done, as Duffy continues looking at his pulsating arm. He ends up freaking out a bit and becoming majorly angry. He finds a bat and, like, for some reason, the guy in the baseball uniform is carrying a bat with them. Like, why did he bring his bat? Anyway, I don't know. But he ends up swinging away Merrill and running outside as a giant blood welt bursts on his face. Uh, we'll get to why that's the case. So now we have an understanding that likely the neurons of the body are all dividing. We need to understand further why this would cause issues. As the increased strength of information is coming in for the neurons to basically contract muscle more vigorously, the muscles would begin breaking down, known as rhabdomyolysis. This is when muscle cells begin dying from overuse or overworked and it's not really good. A lot of people can get it from like bodybuilding or just picking up an exercise too soon. I've never had it, but I do have a friend who ended up working out so much that she just basically got it out of nowhere. And comparatively to how much I lift, it was interesting because she wasn't really working out more than me. It's just, you must know that some people are just genetically predispositioned to have rhabdomyolysis. So anyways, uh, it has far reaching consequences for the body. And what's more alarming, it's more common than people might actually realize. As the muscles break down, the kidneys will attempt to filter your blood containing the broken down components of the muscle in your bloodstream. This can damage the kidneys in turn, causing a potential buildup of toxins in the bloodstream, leading to blood vessel damage. And this may be why we see the blood vessels turning a dark color as his natural filtration system is overwhelmed by all the breaking down muscle. As the degradation of the body continues, this would in turn cause blood vessels to burst, creating blood welts fairly quickly. And this is why it bursts from the skin. The body would begin to decompensate quite rapidly at this point because we can also assume the same damage is being presented to the rest or at least being presented on the outside of the body. The rest of the circulatory system is dealing with the same issues. So in the brain, for instance, or in the liver. So now this is physically what the body is going through and why it's basically getting more damaged as time goes along. But we'll get more into the effects in the brain here in a moment. So get this, Sam is allowed into an active crime scene because he has a student paper badge. Absolutely hilarious. He tries to talk to the doctor again, but gets stood up. And meanwhile, in the frat ball area, this guy just can absolutely not let go of the previous night's events. Like, dude, get over it. Over at the dorms, Debbie isn't feeling so hot as Lauren then heads to the library to study. This lends credence to the idea that this is a communicable disease transferred through things like biting. And this indicates to me, it is our old pal Rabies. Sam now then heads over to Duffy's to check on him, but finds him nowhere to be seen. Duffy is running around just tearing signs out of the ground like a madman and starts beating cars with it. You know, as you do. This noise attracts the attention of the cops as they give chase. Heading inside the building, one of the cops gets the jump on him and we see Duffy has slightly changed. Broken blood vessels, wild eyes, sweaty still, the whole nine yards. Sam during this event is developing film and finds the baboon picture. So get this right, Sam comes out of the developing room and for some reason the student newspaper gets a call from cops or at least somebody who saw the situation where a cop just got bodied and they're like, oh hey Sam, can you go over there? And he's like, yeah, of course. Bro, is the scene even safe? 
Arriving at the scene, well, the doctor is there, and finally Sam gets the interview as he shows him the baboon picture, saying, I know you have a baboon, which means you're guilty. Also, Debbie continues to look rather infected. This would indicate that the incubation period falls likely within a 24-hour period. As it gets more and more familiar with the human physiology, however, it will become more adept, although rabies is already a mammalian disease anyhow, so it's not like it's really going to have that much issue kind of figuring us out, because it's already pretty intimately familiar with our physiology. So Debbie has the same issues as Duffy as frat boys drive along. They spot Debbie walking along. They grab her for which, uh, I'm not sure if this is just like a caricature of fraternities in the 80s or maybe it was a real thing. I don't know. I wasn't around in the 80s, but good lord, that's just straight up abduction. In the interview, the doctors say the baboon isn't sick. It's having an abnormal reaction to the medication that he developed. Yeah, I don't know about that one, chief. It was definitely having an immune response to a virus, much like anything else. So frat boys literally just uh, straight up have Debbie in their dorm room, which this was uncomfortable to watch. So she starts hulking out, biting, punching, kicking, you know, all the classics. Randomly in the professor's car, uh, he passes the sorority house to drop that girl off as they head into the woods. The 80s continue to be a lawless wasteland. This turns into quite literally, like no lie, just internet movie levels of dialogue between the two. As they hear something in the woods, the professor's like, oh, it's probably just a raccoon. Why is it always a raccoon in these events? So as the professor uh, heads out warning them that he knows Kung Fu, the raccoon was in the car the whole time and takes out the sorority girl. As the professor gets back in there and then takes him out, or he takes him out, by dragging his hand across his face. Everyone knows that's an instant knockout. Don't ask any questions here. At Sam's, the cops now arrive to break into the apartment. Ah, memories of my freshman dorm. Those were great times. Just kidding, they were complete crap. That said, Duffy isn't there, so they just kind of leave, but Sam gets on his freaking moped again and goes to follow them to conduct his own research. As that happens, Lauren is walking through the back rooms from the looks of it, and she's unnerved when she hears something living in the back rooms, so she takes off running in the back rooms and then just runs into some random dude trying to chase her down. I have no idea why this happened. He just sort of shows up. It's literally just there to fake you out. But then she hears a heroic moped in the distance. And I bet you, I would put $5. That is the first time you've ever heard that statement in your life. I just combined those words and now you know them. You're welcome. Also, I'm pretty sure this man has like a tracker on her as he's literally everywhere she is. So as Lauren then heads back to her dorm, she calls out for Debbie, but she's nowhere to be seen. Heading to the shower, she checks herself out for a while, as one does, before jumping in. Great water pressure for a dorm, I'll tell you that. But then we get a creeping dolly shot. And here's Debbie. We get this scene between Debbie and Lauren, and at first, you had my curiosity, but now you have my attention. And then it ends too early. Eh, oh well. So now we head back to Duffy's. Sam sees him, and boy, he is not looking good. Standing there like someone who's quite infected, he's able to slightly contain his rage for a moment before going after Sam and attempting to do the same finisher move he did on the cop, rubbing his hand across his jaw. He then hands him a force multiplier as Sam is forced to take out Duffy as the zits on his face continue to leak blood. So now the question becomes, what is going on with his rage? Now, there are several things in the brain that require a very intricate balance to properly function. Emotional control is no easy task for the brain, which can be highlighted by things like mental disorders, as if even one chemical is absent in the right amount, this can cause a person to essentially struggle with this control. But there are also physical parameters to the brain that must be in balance to, well, properly function. The concept of, well, if we want to be smarter, why don't we just add neurons, is what a lot of people inherently think, but brain size does not always equal intelligence. The brain-body mass ratio is something that is still argued about to this day amongst neurologists. This example I like to point to most often is how Einstein's brain was actually smaller than normal in terms of mass, but it had an extra gyri fold in the frontal cortex to number four rather than the standard three that humans have. And that's off the top of my brain. It might be different, but basically he had more folds in his brain. However, again, the brain was smaller than average, yet obviously he was highly intelligent. A case could be made, for instance, for efficiency over size. More neurons present an issue in the human brain. The more tissue a signal has to travel through, the slower it takes. This means that if you needed to make like a quick decision, it could take longer, which could impact your chances of surviving. Our brain is fine-tuned to utilize neurons as that's what it has to communicate with and the functions to operate must fall within standard parameters. If you make more neurons and then just start cramming them into the brain, which appears to be what this virus is doing by turning on the mitotic genes of the neurons, this would slow down communication between areas of the brains. And with that, control over yourself decreases. The lower portions of the brain, known as the lizard brain, which is not actually a lizard brain, it's just a very old portion of the brain that's likely been around for a very long time, is where things like instincts, 
hunger, and rage are. Which, considering how the infected hosts behave, this would make sense. And these emotional areas of the brain are typically the first to react when dealing with the world. And this is why when someone is being aggressive to you, you may get a flash of anger before the emotional control kicks in to add some logic to the situation. For instance, I had a guy one time, I have a really weird thing where if somebody threatens me directly with a very specific phrase or something, I... <laughs> this is cringe, I know, but you'll, like, at least me, I don't see red. I'm like, oh, I would just go Hulk out. But I do definitely feel it. I had a guy threaten to break my jaw one time. And before I knew it, uh, I had jumped on him. And <laughs> I was kind of putting my fingers behind his collarbones and pulling up. Because this dude had threatened me in a very specific way. And I'm like, there's no way he's not going to try that. But that would be the emotional part of my brain taking over before the logical side kind of kicked in after about, I think, 10 seconds. And I realized what I was doing. So I was like, ooh, I probably shouldn't do that. But the whole point is when we are aggressive, it's because of this emotional area being activated. And there's another area of our brain that is supposed to kind of mitigate this, but sometimes it takes it a second to kick in. As neurons in the brain continue to divide, the emotional control center of the brain in the frontal cortex, despite not being that far distance wise, at least from what we would think, from the emotional centers of the brain, such as the amygdala, it would have difficulty controlling the emotional response of the host due to all the tissue quite literally being in the way, causing them to behave more aggressively. On top of this, we can assume with neurons dividing and connecting, connections are becoming more dense, leading to a bleed over effect, such as say if you felt any emotion while infected, this could cause anger as the amygdala becomes activated as well. This anger accompanied with the infection, making the person overall not feel well with the increased muscular contractional strength would make the infected person a formidable foe. The control center of the brain would also not keep the amygdala in check as readily as the person would become more and more aggressive. Ultimately, this results in a person who is violent, strong, and ruthless. That said, if they recognize a person as a former friend, there are other ways which they might be able to interact, which we will kind of get there in a second and how that works. In the doctor's laboratory, Sam calls him saying that Duffy is donezo. Sam hangs up on him because he says that he must do an autopsy. I think that'll get you sent to jail, uh, but hey, what do I know? Also, it's near Halloween, and apparently the entire campus knows about Duffy, despite it just happening like literal minutes ago. Lauren then tells Debbie that she looks sick as well, and then Debbie's like, yeah, I got a bite from Duffy, which kind of activates Sam's almonds. They head over to her dorm, finding it torn apart due to the fact that Debbie's jimmies were rustled to the ninth dimension. Sam then tells her to get out of there, as then they go to the living room, and <laughs> look, they got as far as they could, I guess. So Debbie then launches her attack as she was still in there on the two, taking out Sam pretty quickly as then she goes after Lauren, but she hits her head with a timer and then Sam then calls a doctor and then checks on her status. He administers a sedative to kind of knock her out and then carry her literal body to his lab. No way he's getting past the front desk, but somehow he does. So now we are in the lab. You see, the doctor was working on an antigen for the medication. He requests being left alone with her. Yeah, I don't know about that one, doc, but uh, he injects her with the mystery concoction and it's now the next morning. Lauren starts talking about if they're, you know, if they are infected, and I mean, anything is possible, but Sam then straight tells Lauren, yeah, I shot Duffy. <laughs> then I set his place on fire. You see, uh, Mercury was in microwave, and I'm a Pluridon or something like that. I don't know. I don't believe astrology. So he has a good cry about it. Well, not in the movie, that is. He actually has to turn away from the camera because his character can't cry. But oh, look, Sam's roommate has shown up, and we never see this guy again. That that's the whole joke. He just kind of shows up. So the doctor continues to test as he notes that the T cells are not being produced. And if you were any self-respecting doctor, you would know that the adaptive immune system takes days to respond to an infection, not 24 hours. And in this case, you just administered it late last night. So it's probably been like six hours. So he says it's too late to save her. This guy gets hot and bothered by the prospect of research, as we will call it. And he says... Since you are no longer of sound body and mind, I've made the decision for you. Bro is definitely going to jail for medical crimes, for sure. So over at Fratopia, which apparently is only just these three guys and nobody else, one guy is doing bicep curls with horrible form. Look at it, he's like throwing it up with momentum. And there's an argument that when you're tired, you can use momentum. Uh, no. I mean, then again, I'm not a bodybuilder, but, but you know what? I do lift, so... Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say you need control. So the other guy in the skeleton costume has a fairly gnarly infection on his pectoral. And this does denote at some point in the concerning like the entry of the body that the body will launch an immune response of sorts, but is quickly overwhelmed. This further indicates that this is a pathogenic issue such as a virus. Although some bacteria is likely in there as well because it's broken skin. That said, they all look uh, like pretty rough, like sweating really bad. 
and their aggression levels are rising and they want to get trashed. Honestly, combining those two things, what could possibly go wrong? So at this point, Debbie also breaks free and attacks the doctor, biting him and catching him with a needle Dead Space 2 style. Meanwhile, at the party, Sam and Lauren then sit at the party, not even dressed as anything, and discuss the situation. They decide to go call the doctor to see how the whole thing is going. The doctor, however, has his ocular cavity pierced and is busy with that. The frat guys at this point are also hammered and just knocking down doors for some reason. Actually, you know what? That sounds completely normal for a uh, Thursday night back at my fraternity house. Ask me how I know. It's because I was the treasurer and I had to write checks to fix all of that. I'll tell you what though, those dudes got cranked up if you broke something. Anyways, uh, where was I? Yes. So going to the doctor's office, they then find Debbie missing and a random rat on the floor, which, okay, sure. Over to the parking lot, frat boys then get stopped by somebody calling them a doucher and check out that 73 duster. Again, the 70s weren't great for vehicles, but there were some high points. The duster, however, was a midpoint. Still though, Looks better than most vehicles do now. And as he says that, the frat boys literally tear apart his car and then he just kind of runs off and does a smart thing. Debbie is also hulking out on one dude in a baby costume. He's like, hey, nice costume. And then gets scalped for the crime of that. <laughs> Tough break, man. So at the party, despite all the endings in the surrounding area, they still have it. And they are now having like cops at the party. And one of the cops then finds Debbie hyperventilating in the back. She grabs him and she rips off something. I'm not sure what it was, but yeah. So the frat boys also are just straight up uh, ripping dudes tracheas out along the way. And uh, now we go into this 80s random concert on campus. I'm not sure what the frat boys plans are at this point. Uh, the costumes look absolutely sick. The music is absolutely mid. The frat boys just start literally taking out people with nobody noticing because it's a Halloween party in college. And I'm 100% sure everyone is very sober. But they tank their way through the mobs as they spot Lauren and then go after her. Cornering her, they start breathing like a madman as Player 3 has now entered the game. Debbie goes after Skeletor as another one then finds Sam as then he runs away. Now, this specific point further indicates the human brain is in some form or fashion kind of operational. Despite the connections becoming more dense through what is essentially an entire brain cancer issue, the ability to communicate decreasing some former feelings are still going to exist. The frat boys do not like Sam and they just kind of want to go after Lauren. So what would likely feel like dragging a concrete bucket through sand, the recognition of Lauren does cause Debbie to play a more defensive role, which can still be influenced by anger. But at this point, it just comes down to physical strength. While Debbie does possess strength similar to an uninfected man due to the more dense neuronal connections in the muscle, at the end of the day, she still has roughly 30% less muscle mass than a male would. Because of this, her contractional strength is less than that of one of the frat boys who are infected, and she is eventually overwhelmed. Running to the bleachers, the guy continues to give chase as those are retractable bleachers. I wonder how this is gonna go. Yes, retracting the bleachers. Skellington doesn't get out of the way in time and gets absolutely got, which was fantastic. Lauren now hides in what I assume is the coach's room as there's still one skeleton man left. The clothes refuse to stop moving as he walks around the corner but gets bashed in the face. Sam then finds Debbie just absolutely destroyed. To tear a person in half like this would require an insane amount of strength. The ribs typically will not be pulled apart in such a manner, but the skin would likely give way like this. And it's the 80s, so there has to be a shot of a chest, which that's going to be blurred. But who would have ever thought that these guys with questionable morals and self-control as a regular human would turn out to be the main antagonist? As he continues to chase Lauren, her plan is to hide in the locker Outlast style as the frat boy walks along. He ends up passing her, but of course she accidentally makes a noise. So he returns back to the locker as then he rips the door open as Sam comes in with the axe. And I know you can't see it, but this is the cleanest cut you've ever seen. So Lauren is going to need some therapy. Uh, I'm pretty sure as people have finally noticed that the Halloween bash wasn't as fun as initially thought it was going to be. They load up Debbie into a paddy wagon as the whole family is now done. Literally the loss of a bloodline right there. So now that is concluded, uh, it seems Sam and Lauren are heading back over because there's nothing like trauma bonding. But wait, it's not over. The doctor has arrived and he's begun his attack. He grabs Lauren as Sam was walking downstairs, somehow got back up three flights of stairs to take out the doctor. Quite literally, they just end this dude and they casually just don't report it at all. Like, haha, let's go on Thanksgiving break now. Don't worry about that body. Also fun fact, uh, during the credit scene, this has nothing to do with anything, but most of the women are named like Babe 1, Babe 2, and of course, lest we forget, Babe 3. Now, if you made it through that, I really do commend you and you can be my friend because what did we actually just watch? Along with that, as I write this now, I'm listening to some horrendous song for the ninth time. I gotta tell you, like, it really doesn't get any better. In fact, at the end of the movie, there is a black screen for over a minute and a half with just this song playing. 
They really wanted you to know about this song, but thus concludes Primal Rage. The Primal Rage virus to me appears to be a form of rabies due to its propensity to target the central nervous system. However, it was never really ready for human testing, and it was more accidentally leaked into the human environment. It becomes clear that while this may have worked on mice and possibly even a baboon in some cases in humans, due to the rapid growth of neurons in an already healthy brain, this would put pressure on the brain as well as disrupt emotional control. Upon this happening, the person would become highly aggressive and fall back into a more primitive state because more neurons doesn't always equal more better. And in this case, it disrupts the fine-tuned ability of the brain to operate. Ultimately, for an infected person, they would not be long for this world. If the rhabdomyolysis, in fact, didn't get them, and which this would cause kidney failure, where they would reach MODs or multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, and the blood would just become more toxic, it would continue to destroy blood vessels, and then more alarmingly, what would really get them is what's happening in the brain, which would lead to several issues, like pressure on the brain. But even if this weren't the case, the neurons dividing the brain, the space is exceedingly limited, and you would start decompensating at a point where there's so much pressure in the brain introduced by the addition of other neurons that tissue would begin dying off in droves, leading to a vegetative state in just a few days, coma, and ultimately your end. The doctor overall had the beginnings of a good idea. Forcing mitosis into damaged area of the brains to help it heal with a localized application of this, this could fix things like stroke damage or paralysis or even other diseases of the brain such as dementia and Alzheimer's. The issue is, however, with a runaway growth like this, what he has effectively done is create a transmissible form of brain cancer that if allowed to spread would likely require the nuking of an entire area before it spreads, as these people are still able to somewhat think, they've just become more aggressive. And that means, because they can almost think, they can plan. And you know, it really sort of reminds me of the movie The Crazies, actually. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you want to leave a like because you want to get this into the algorithm, that is greatly appreciated. And subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Roanoke Tales channel links in the description for all those interested. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Des Dancer. Thank you for your continued support, bro. I'd also like to thank our scientists, Chad W., Lacune, Logan Satome, and Tyson Naganishi. And the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your support goes a long way towards keeping everything running and is greatly appreciated. So that's going to do it for me, Jurassic Park next week. Until then, I'll see y'all in the next one.